Hello, and welcome to Fails, Falls, and Fuck-Ups. Today, the fuck-up on the plate is Jim Meskimen, actor extraordinaire, a man of a thousand and one voices, but today, he's only going to be using one of those, his own. We're going to talk about how he built his career, the successes, but not really the successes, because really, who cares? The failures, <laughs> the way he's used the pain of messing up to grow as a human being, because he's grown to quite a stature in his art. Jim, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for inviting me, and, and thanks for this interesting platform to discuss uh, something that nobody ever asks about. Like, where did you go wrong? What was your big misstep? Yeah. God, Jim, where did you go wrong? What was your big mi misstep? Well, it's, it's, of course, a very introverting question to ask, but I don't mind looking inward for a moment. And uh, I, I'm actually sort of primed for this because I was just thinking about probably the biggest misstep of my professional career. Uh, I, was, I was doing pretty well as an actor. I, I'd been in New York City for about nine years, I think, and uh, maybe 10. So you were a professional for nine or 10 years at that point. No, but I've been in New York City for for that much. I, I I grew my career in New York City for the first two years. I was I was floundering. I was struggling. I was treading water, but everything was was getting better. And uh, after about ten years of being there, I, I went through a uh, my. You may not know this about me, but I was a visual artist first. I was a painter, illustrator, cartoonist. I worked in that field uh, to uh, basically pay for me going into acting. All the while, I was studying acting, studying improv, doing shows for free. And then uh, eventually, I was able to quit my my uh, doing art for other people and just be do commercials, do radio, voiceovers, things like that, which financed my more ambitious things. Um, so I was just coming out of New York and, and moved back to Los Angeles, where I grew up. Because I had a lot of TV offers for like to develop shows, I, I had made a big enough splash in my twenties uh, that people were at ABC and other studios were like saying, "Hey, you know, this guy could could headline a series." So they gave you a development deal. I had offers from about three different areas, so ABC and uh, I forget the others, but there were there were majors, you know, at the time. NB NBC for our younger um, viewers. And Back in a time, there was only three networks, and <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you you got off like he only got offers from three places, not because there weren't other people who might have been interested. It's just they didn't exist. They didn't exist yet. That's right. <laughs> so you were fielding offers from the big three, the only three. I was fielding offer, offers from the big ones, and um, you know I was in my twenties and I didn't have a whole lot of business sense on this way, and I never worked in television at all. I'd I'd done one film, I'd done tons of commercials and, and voiceover things and animated series and stuff, but I, I did not really know from from television, even though my mother is a, a very successful television icon, Marion Ross, who played Marion Cunningham on Happy Days. Everybody loves Mrs. C. It's true. Everybody loves Mrs. C. And if they don't, I don't talk to them. Um, no. So I got offered this part, and they... they um, they did what was called a backdoor pilot, and they put me on an episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which a friend of mine was was one of the producers of. A guy I'd gone to school with was one of the producers of, and then I knew uh, one of his lawyers, one of Will Smith's lawyers, who was also a friend of mine from junior high school. And they kind of pitched this idea that, hey, maybe we'll do this pilot on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and Jim will play his teacher. And they wrote this special script for me. It was uh, which is still it's still on the air today, and I still get recognized from it probably more than any other thing I've ever done, uh, where I play Will Smith's Western philosophy teacher. I do impressions in the show, and I, I it's a very lively, fun show. And then after that, they said, well, we want to be in the Jim Eskimen business, so we'd like to develop that series and make you the professor and, you know, and develop and spin off, basically, into your own show. You're a different world to Will Smith's yes. The Cosby Show. It all happened so fast, but at the same time, I was developing kind of a show, not formally developing, but we, my improv group and I had been planning to do an improvised show on television. And this is before Whose Line Is In Any Way really hit over here. It was in England, but it hadn't hit over here. And it was before anybody really credited that improv was a thing. 
uh, very few improv groups. We had a really good one, and we did music and comedy, and I w- had invested hundreds and maybe thousands of hours of work with them. Did you come from the Groundlings School, the Second City School, or um, what was your base philosophy? It was probably more related to Second City, but it wasn't either of those places. It was a uh, kind of an offshoot. There was a woman named Tamara Wilcox who had studied with Del Close, who you probably recognize as a famous name of improv, who launched many, many uh, groups and many, many performers. And Didn't he create the Herald? Created the Herald, and we used to do Heralds all every Friday night. So, yeah, so the it was a very... Uh, I liked it. I, you know, I grew up in a, in a theatrical family, so I was not um, just nuts about improv that was of a stand-up comedy bent. I was interested in a theatrical improv discipline, and that's what I learned from from Tamara at her school. So in New York, we had this kind of, it was a little bit, uh, what could I say? Uh, we, we had a school, we, we did shows. Uh, we had a certain viewpoint. And uh, we didn't do blue material. We didn't do a bunch of dick jokes. Uh, we did uh, improvised operas. We did improvised Broadway musicals. We did improvised stand-up. And uh, we tried to really stretch the definition of what you could do with improv. So when it came time to, like, branch off on my own, in my own career, I had a lot of trepidation because I <laughs> part of that was, unfortunately, f- foisted a little bit on me by uh, the woman running the group who made a little bit of a mistake herself in, in you know, making me feel like I, I was shabby if I took another kind of job, you know, a different kind of opportunity. You would have heard of an acting coach teacher creating dependence almost in a cult-like manner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, despite all her good intentions, that's that's basically what happened. And I I, I just sort of, uh, I, I flinched. I flinched. And I even though I had this great offer, I just I, there was another offer on the table from a producer, uh, a guy named Fred Silverman, another name you may remember. Fred Silverman was the head of ABC at one point. He was the head of Paramount at one point. He had stats. He was not a nobody. And he wanted to do a late night show. This was at a time when the late night, it was all um, stirred up because Johnny was leaving. And uh, I know Pat Sajak was launching a late night show and uh, Chevy Chase. And there was a lot of shifting around. So this was an idea for a late night show that would involve my improv company. I would be the headliner, but it would involve everybody. And so I went, gosh, I, I flinched. And I, I, I took that, even though there was zero money. It was like a development deal with no cash, but with a with a possibility of a golden dream. And uh, and so I, I just sort of thumbed my nose at the the nice offer from NBC, the nice offer from ABC. And uh, for the next two years, I spent uh, developing this terrible show that went nowhere, a great loss of, of human blood, you know, and, and just <laughs> anxiety. So in creating the show, did it ever actually get to a point where you had a filmed presentable pilot? Yeah, we did a couple we did a couple of pilots, you know, we, we, we did one and then it was like, eh, this isn't quite right. And we did another one and then everyone just, they just all kind of went to Flinders. You know, we, we didn't have a good relationship between the people that were creating the show and our creative entity. And uh, it was fraught. It was fraught with a lot of uh, weaknesses and uh, probably could have been great, but uh, it was not was not a a single singularity of purpose, you know, and not a you know the best shows have a kind of a viewpoint, and there's usually one person that uh, sort of sets the pace, sets the tone, steers the ship very well. We did not have that person. We had several people that were kind of wrestling all the time, and uh, and and me, I was just like, I'll I'll just do whatever, you know, just tell me what to do, and that of course is not a great position of strength either. Never works. So unfortunately, it just kind of crashed and burned. So here's a question for you about this. So you had, an, you had numerous offers, and they were all built around, we like this guy, Jim. Like this guy, Jim, right. has this potential. Right. One of these offers was to be a sitcom built around you as the lead guy, which is you in right. the hot seat. What you chose was an ensemble thing where you were the main guy, but only just so. 
do you think that there were elements of fear of imposter syndrome? What do you think behind everything else? What do you think made you make the choice to be more in a group setting as opposed to taking that step forward, really putting you out there as the thing? Yeah, I, well, I can't speak about imposter syndrome, but uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I was, you know, I, my acting training and experience at that time was as a as a group player, as a, a team player. So I was not a, uh, although I had my side career as a singular uh, commercial actor, I was very comfortable with being a, I liked the dynamics of being a team player. I liked operating with a group. I felt like there was a lot more, obviously a lot more strength. We had a guy that was a genius piano player. We had a girl who was a terrific singer. We had two other brilliant improviser guys. And, and it was like, wow. We had, I knew that whenever we would do a show as Interplay, by the name, the name of the group was Interplay, I knew that if we could get 30 people in a room, they would have an almost religious experience. It would be so fun and so funny and so creative. They would have a great time. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't like probably as confident that I, as a single performer, I could produce that level of pleasure in an audience. I also, in the back of my mind, Bruce, I, I kind of knew that I was caving in. And uh, I just, I, I let my friends kind of wear me down a little bit. And, and that wasn't a very nice thing to do to them, you know, because I have to take more responsibility. And go, well, it's my choice. I, I did it. And I I chose the one that was the least likely to succeed. And what does that mean? I mean, that's kind of a, a treasonous viewpoint. Because if I had, I mean, anything could have happened, right? I, if we look at the mm -hmm. what ifs, like if, okay, maybe they would have launched the pilot. Maybe they would have launched the series and it could have died after three episodes or four episodes or even a season. Buh. A lot of people, that happened a lot of people in the 90s. A lot of very talented people. Happens all the time now. Could have gone nowhere and I'd have to pick up everything and start over again. Could it have been a huge hit? Could have been a huge hit, maybe. Would that have changed my life and allowed me to help my group a little more? That could have happened, too. So we just don't know. Here's what I would like to know, though. You had this experience where, again, you weren't quite ready to step forward forward. How did you get to that point? How did you get that confidence? I'm sure right now, if I were to go, hey, Jim, got a show, you're the lead. You'd be like, yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'll be there. Yeah. And I've had that experience. I, I finally rebuilt it. It took quite a great deal of time, but I did finally get back in that position again. And I, and I, I didn't push for any of my friends to be in the show. <laughs> like, all right, let me, if we can squeeze them in, that's fine. My sister is a, a television producer and she, uh, and a writer, she won an Emmy for her work on Friends. And uh, Ellen is her name, Ellen Kramer. And she, she described it one time because she, she had her own show and we were all like, okay, can, can, can I be on it? And can, can my daughter be on it? My wife be on it? And she's like, let me, let me get in the lifeboat first. <laughs> and then I'll start hauling people aboard, you know. Let me establish myself before I'm trying to establish you because right now they're yeah. like, who are you? We just brought you on two weeks <laughs> yeah. ago. Exactly. exactly. But again, back to the question. At some point, you had to come to, I would assume, to some degree of confidence that you could be the guy. How did that occur for you? How did you finally go, oh, that's right. I am this good. You know, as I said, I did a lot of commercials, and I, I, I was very fortunate in that I stumbled into, well, I went to an audition one day, and it was for a, <clears throat> a grocery chain in, in Texas. And, and a few other states where I, I went in and they were looking for somebody to interview people, man on the street interviews in the store. And so I'd been doing all this improv. I'd been studying, you know, working off the cuff and uh, also studying communication in general. And so I walked into this interview and I just killed it, you know. So they hired me and then eventually it grew to be a yearly contract where I would go and do all their commercials, all the radio, all the TV and then I would do, then I got other jobs for other companies and it really turned into a multi-million dollar business. And so that gave me tremendous confidence because I had no writer. I had just a camera, you know, and, and a guy, a boom operator and a whole lot of shoppers and some people from the agency. And we created award-winning stuff and it was on TV and 
paid good money. So I felt like a grown up. You know, I felt like, oh, I'm a, I, I have a creative voice that is valuable to people. And that, that makes you feel great. The entire campaign was based on the strength of your ability to talk to these people and your ability to think on your feet. Yeah. And after a bunch of that, that gave you the confidence that prior, maybe not there. And performing live on stage with very little. And uh, so all, all that was very, uh, very validating, you know, and, and practical. And um, the reason why improv, I think, is one of these things that is always stressed for actors today is like we see the um, there's just a difference uh, when we see a performance that has some sort of improvisational quality to it. We, we, we're, we're always looking for authenticity especially these days with the, the way the technology is going and stuff. We're, we're looking for someone like right now. I mean, I'm speaking as authentically as I can. I have not written this out ahead of time or you and I have never rehearsed it. And, and there's something always more compelling about that. Uh, so the, and, and it, when you can pull it off and when it gets recognized and when you can make a living at it, you know, you just feel very, very confident and unshakable. The skills that I learned in improv has made it very possible for me to just fly with anything from this to even just being in like, even in your real life, a weird situation yeah. happens. You're able to think on your feet and move it forward. And it also buys you a lot of ability to be charming. One of the things <laughs> I tell everybody who like, I don't know how to talk to girls or like, I'm a, I, I'm trying to get into this business. I don't know how to talk to customers. It's like, go take an improv class. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, well, our school we taught Wall Street people, dentists, uh, salesmen all the time, and because it's basically applied agreement, it's negotiating. It's it, you know, as you know, agreement is at the foundation of it. Yes. And one thing that separates the Chicago school that you studied with uh, from maybe places like the Groundlings is uh, there's a, there's an intense belief in agreement and yes and relationships in the, in the Chicago way of doing it, which is also the way that I, I learned it through, you know, different channels. The yes and thing is just tr tremendously potent. The point that I took the most from it was the strength of relationships. Basically the key to the Chicago style of improv or one of the keys is that instant establishment of familiar relationship and common ground so that you're relating. It's not two guys in an elevator having a situation. It's two brothers finally taking this moment to finally having it out after 40 years of fighting over one particular toy. And now that this boils over into this moment in time, it's all that relationship building that makes it so strong. And that's what makes it very important for just everyday thing. Because when you're if you can build a relationship with somebody and improv makes it possible to do that on a drop of a hat, like on the dime, well, then people connect to you, bond to you when things are going wrong. If you can make a relationship with the person that's going wrong with, you can handle that situation in a much smoother fashion. I agree. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a lot of listening. Of course, improv doesn't exist without a lot of listening and understanding what has been said and remembering what has been said. So that's, that's important in relationships too, it turns out. Any other good mistakes that made you go, this is something I did in my career that I will never, ever do again. And here's what I learned from it. Well, I mean, that's the most dramatic one where I went, you know, I, I, a door was opened and I walked to another door that led to, you know, an alley <laughs> instead of, <laughs> <laughs> a nice banquet room, let's say. But I, it, I was also, um, you know, it's one of these things where you, you don't notice something that's quite obvious maybe to other people. And these days I have made my big, biggest mark as an impressionist, as doing celebrity voices. I do Colonel Sanders on a KFC brand and uh, on their radio and television. And that's, a, that's an impression job right there. But I've also done uh, Robin Williams for the genie and the, the Aladdin uh, things for Disney, you know, uh, the blue genie. And there's all kinds of permutations of things that Robin couldn't do because he didn't want to and now he can't. Um, and I've done uh, you know, Patrick Stewart and, and Colin Firth and Robert De Niro, just a lot of different guys. Uh, it's, it's something that I do all the time for, you know, that's my job. And... The reason why it's a mistake or, or a, a flaw is that I just didn't credit that that was the thing that I should always 
kind of lead with and and market myself as, right? So, uh, you know, as I said before, I, I had a different sort of career in my youth. I did uh, man on the street interviews and I was just like a kind of a Midwestern sounding guy. And, but I would make a big splash when I did drag out the impressions. And it wasn't until I re- my back really got against the wall in 2008 that I, that I sort of took a look at all these high peaks in my career and realized that impressions was part of all of them. And I would, I would kind of let that skill and that, that approach languish for months and years sometimes and then pick it up again. And by chance, I would do it and I would have the success. So it was just kind of like not paying attention to the fact that, well, this is what, forget about what you want to do and how people see you. This is what sort of makes makes me look more obvious. And uh, it's a good thing to lead with. Um, so it, really, it, it took a long time to learn that lesson. And then now I, I do not omit to uh, create a lot of improv, uh, a rather impressionist content on my YouTube channel and, and Instagram and TikTok and to do live shows and to always put that in the fore. And it allows me then to pursue other things. But as a marketing thing and a way to set myself apart, it's just stupid to avoid it or, or to ignore it or to neglect it, which is kind of what I did before uh, off and on. A lot of people, because it's not the primary thing they want to be known for, will neglect very marketable skills that can get them in the door. I have to ask you this about the impressionist skill. Did it come naturally for you? Did it, was it the kind of skill that you just, you could hear a voice and without giving it too much thought, place it in your mouth, get the, the breath right and get the cadence right? Or did you have to work on it? Is it the kind of thing that as you let it go, that it went away? Oh, no, it, it never, never goes away, luckily. I mean, uh, I, I did start very organically and naturally. And, uh, you know, there is such a thing as talent, I suppose. Uh, it's very hard for me to discern where my talent is and where my hard work and interest lie, you know, where the, that borderline. Because for me, it's just been something that I started as a kid because I liked it. And I guess I was good at it. Uh, but, you know, I was a little kid. <laughs> So right. how good could I have been? I but I was very interested in it, and I was and my mom was great at uh, tolerating it and not shutting me down. Uh, she's an actress herself, so I think she understood the need to create and the need to and the, the value of doing accents and and sounding like different people and performing and playing. And I mean, she demonstrated to me that it was fun to play that way. She would imitate people and she would do accents and stuff, and it was just like oh, it's coin of the realm in my house. You know, it's just the way we would operate. Uh, later on, uh, as it became like a thing where I was pursuing it as a job sometimes, uh, I, 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 did, I did study it a bit like, well, how do I, I, I applied my perceptions and my sensibilities to it. And then um, I worked at it. You know, I, I would record myself and I'd listen and, uh, and I'd put things on stage and I'd and I'd videotape myself and I try to get better. And to this day, I, I try to get better. It's all about differentiation. It's all about these subtle changes and these, uh, the musicality and the rhythm. And there's all these different factors involved. And it's really impossible to totally, fully duplicate another human being's sound. There's always, you know, little, little factors that are just impossible to duplicate. But you can come really close, particularly with ones that have where you share a certain biology or a certain structure, you know. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, I've found that I can do Tommy Lee Jones better than a lot of people because I don't know why, but I just I, we share a certain kind of musculature or something. So I just have to tweak it a little bit. I can sound like him. Uh but other other characters, I have to. It's a bit more of a stretch, you know. So, I think it's a lifelong thing. I think I'm always chasing it. I'm always interested. Uh, but but I I create that interest too. I realize this is an important thing to focus on because whatever else is going on in my life, I need to always kind of play this card. This is my bread and butter. This is my bread and butter. No matter what, this is the money. This is the money. If I, you know. Everything else is fine, but uh, yeah, exactly. Jim, 
I would like you to be an elder statesman for a moment. And I would like you to look out there through your camera lens. Yeah, that way. That way is good. That way is good. Those spikes over there are really interesting. Look at those spikes and speak to a younger generation of artists. Give them some of your best wisdom on how to get started, mm. how to get past various hangups and trip points. Is trip points a phrase? We all, we, we get the idea of what that's supposed to mean, where they're going to screw up and how to hang on. What advice would you give? Well, actually, I've, I've made it the subject of a, an online course that I, I have available at uh, jimworkingactor.com, but I'll give you, a, I'll give you just a little, little couple of snippets. I'm very happy to, to share what I've learned. And, uh, you know, as you've, as you've seen, I, you know, I've had some, some pretty big missteps that probably set me back a decade or more. So I know a thing or two, but I'm, I'm still here surviving. And um, I advise a lot of uh, young artists. I'm very interested in helping young people and, and helping young artists in particular. My daughter is, a, is an actress and a voice artist, and I've helped her a lot. And uh, I just I get a kick out of it. I, I feel like we can't have too many artists. We just can't. It's, it's just something you, uh, we might have too many car dealers. We might have too many uh, insurance salesmen. But uh, artists really make the world a pleasant place, and it's it's just great to be among them. So I would say one of the biggest things is uh, there's a kind of a, a there's a kind of a mindset that I find a lot of young, let's say, actors have, where they're kind of waiting to be found and discovered or whatever, and they feel like the career that they want to have is something that is going to be bestowed on them given to them. Someone's going to give them the permission to be great. Give them the permission. Exactly. And then then they will flower and blossom. But they're waiting in a way, and they may not even be conscious of it. They're like kind of drumming their fingers on a tabletop and waiting for that for, to be given permission, to be talented, to be charming, to be wonderful, to be amazing. And uh, and I just think this is a very, a very flawed viewpoint <laughs> because you need to be you need to be this is so stupid <laughs> <laughs> you need to cause your career you're not waiting you're not a, a, a it's not going to be delivered to you you're not the recipient of a career you are the cause point you're the one who makes it and uh, that used to sound like a kind of a death sentence i think because and maybe to this day it still does to some people but uh if you're a cre- if you really are a creative person, you're like waiting to make something. You're like, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to write a play. I want to uh, memorize a scene and work on it and do this thing and then put it on. Uh, and that is indeed the right way to do it. You got to get, you know, you hear this word proactive, which is a tired old word, but it's true. You want to move pro forward in the direction of activity. You want to be the one that creates the thing. Uh, rather than waiting for it to, to for the chance for someone to come or for that audition to come and to be basically the, the effect for your agent to see you as you are ver- like for what you're good at versus like, oh, he's kind of roundish. He can be that guy. You need to define it for yourself. Yeah. And I know, you know, this, you do a lot of content yourself. You do a lot of films, much more than I've, I've, uh, I'm even aware of. And successful people do that. They, you know, I always think about Billy Bob Thornton. Billy Bob Thornton was a talented actor. Then he decided, you know, fuck it, I'm going to write this script. I'm going to shoot this movie. And, you know, now everybody knows who Billy Bob Thornton is. Whatever you think about him, he's a pretty terrific actor. And uh, many, many actors have taken the bull by the horns, created something for themselves. And uh, you have to do that in particular if you're someone who isn't just like a classically beautiful, super sexy, you know, amazingly built, you know, person with amazing hair and teeth. Or if you fit between types. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not an obvious superstar. You're you're a person who who yet has a voice, who yet has talent and wants to do something. Then you have to go, well, what would I put myself in, you know? Uh so anyway, that's the viewpoint that it has to change with most actors. And and then getting busy every day creating something like that, figuring out something that you can do. Because there's there's tons of stuff that one can do, especially these days. It doesn't cost you anything to put something up on YouTube. And you could you can begin to become very, very ready 
for when somebody does offer you something, which will come, you know. But in the meantime, you started off by going, I'm busy. This is what I'm doing, you know, and, and creating the career that way. Ron Howard, another great example, very successful director. I've worked with him in five films. And uh, Ron was a successful actor who wanted to be a director from a young age. And uh, he did not wait around for someone to offer him a directing job. He did short films. He, uh, I worked for him when I was 16 when he was working on a film on the weekends that he wrote with uh, uh, Jim Ritz, a, a film about an actor, and he got Don Most to star in it, and I was you know, helping set up lights on the weekends. And he was filming a feature film on his own money so that he would have some sort of an entryway, and uh, he didn't even get to fi finish that film because he was moving along so well and, and everything was going so great that Roger Corman saw that he had a lot of gumption and, and eventually he got a deal. He leveraged the fact that Roger Corman wanted him in one of his movies yeah. to be like, I'll star in your movie if you let me direct one. That's right. Yeah. Which was a great investment in his own confidence. Yeah. And and you think, well, with a director, it's more obvious. Of course, you know, yeah, you got to wait and work with people and wait for the job to come. But I mean, these days there are plenty of people out shooting independent films with their phones. It's quite easy now, really. And oh, yeah. uh, and telling stories and doing amazing things. And, and that's what you have to do. You have to figure out a way to stay busy creating the career rather than waiting for it to be created by another person and s sent to you via Amazon or whatever. <laughs> sent to you via Amazon. That's just a funny image. Just sort of like they left your career off in the front of your porch and somebody came along and stole it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> You've given advice. What would you say in mentoring and having this course of young actors and young artists, what would you say uniformly? And, and the answer you just gave could fit into this as well, but I'm looking more for a direct negative. What would you say is the biggest mistake most actors make? Well, the one that comes to mind is, I think there's a misunderstanding about art. What is art? And it's reflected in the way that it's taught. And the mistake is in thinking that there is a right and there is a wrong. It's not like other topics. It's not like other subjects. Art is very open-ended. And that's a little scary for people. They want to go to a school where a, an acting guru will say, no, that's not the way you do it. Uh, Harold, show me again. Watch Harold here. He does it right. And you go, okay, I get it, I get it. That's the right way to do it. And then they're protected and they feel great. It's just not true. Uh, we like variety. We like uniqueness. We are all individuals. Everybody's different. It's provable. But when we're starting out, we're a little bit, uh, we're not very confident. We think, well, there must be the proper path. Uh, you know, whenever I, I do seminars or whatever, people are saying, now, on the headshot, do I get, should it have a border? And I'm like, you know what? Should it be black or should it be a white border? <laughs> exactly. And should my name be on the picture or in the border? We're not filling out. We're not checking boxes. We're being creators. And so I, I think the more artistic that you are, the, the more self-determined that you are, the more you decide what's happening, what you decide is what, what's right. All the great artists that you admire are people that went, no, nah, I think it should be like this. And people went, wow, what was that? You know, it's unique, it's different, and it reflects the truth of you know, who they are as a creator. So the time to get started with that is right away and, and, and see if you can pull yourself out of looking for the proper, the right, the correct answer uh, as if you're filling out a form and, you know, begin to really experiment and... and and make your own choices and develop your own judgment because that's what's going to actually build your career, you know, that uniqueness. Because uh, we see things like, like in voiceover, okay, radio commercials. If you listen to a radio commercial from 2000, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but it'll sound like it's from a foreign country in a way. The style is so dramatically different. And when I was doing radio in the 80s, it had a whole different flavor. It was right at the time. But these things evolve and change, and we get tired of this one sort of pat way that everybody starts doing it. They all kind of glom on and do the same style, and it's like, oh, it's a big wash, and nobody cares anymore. 
And then somebody cuts through with another thing. I was like, oh, that's also cool and genuine and interesting. And then people copy the hell out of that. It's so fresh. It's fresh, yeah. And that freshness comes from somebody making an individual decision and it somehow getting past the guards and, and out, into the, out into the courtyard. So. so ultimately, what he's telling you to do is whatever bit of conformist bullshit has been laid on you, um, the key phrase there is bullshit. Don't listen. Find your voice develop your voice. And if you don't know what your voice is, solve that problem first. Yeah. You may not, you may not know. I mean, it may be something that you need to kind of fish around. Like when I was writing my one man show, Jim Pressions back in, as I said, in 2008, where my back was against the wall financially, I was like, I got to make something happen. I got to write a one man show. It was agony to figure out what did I want to say? And, and, even though I'd been doing, working for years and, and making good money and, and having all kinds of great opportunities, it was like suddenly it's like, wow, I have to craft something that I think is unique and that is my voice. And it was hard work. But that's the good kind of work. I mean, any kind of work is going to be hard work. So you might as well do something that is meaningful to you and has your, your juice and your flavor to it. Well, Jim, thank you so much because I do feel that there's a lot of wisdom in those words. And now... Let's just get egregiously commercial and let us go for it. I want you to now take this moment, seize the moment, Jim. And I want you to just plug yourself egregiously, disgustingly, whatever you want to say, say it now. Thank you. Oh, this is great. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, follow me on all the socials. I'm on TikTok at Jim Meskimen. Uh, and this online course, I tell you, I'd really like to know what you think of it. It's uh, jimworkingactor.com. And uh, I've worked very hard at that to try to give all my best pieces of advice in uh, a lot of a video series about marketing, about auditioning, about staying in touch, building a career, surviving over the long haul, all these different topics. So check that out. And uh, and my, my little YouTube channel, which I still feed every day like a like a little beast uh because it's for me a great creative outlet uh and that's jim pressions you can look me up jim pressions and the last thing i'll say is that i've got a tv show that i worked on uh, which is why basically why we met bruce because i got a, a job on a tv show where they wanted me to be a little more physically fit and so eric the trainer we made an agreement and uh, he trained me for, for the show. And then I've continued to work with him. And that's a show called The Big Door Prize. And it will be uh, on Apple TV, I think in October starting up. And that's got the very fine uh, Irish actor, Chris O'Dowd in it. And he's very funny. Oh, Chris. Kind of lovely guy. And uh, Loved the IT crowd. Oh God, it's such a funny show. We're watching it now. It's hilarious. He's Gave me he was... PSTD from my time doing IT work. PTSD. <laughs> I don't know my acronyms. My acronyms? I can't speak English. That's what you don't I don't know can't your acronym do. from your elbow. I don't. I can't communicate with human beings. That's why I'm alone. I'm going to die in this chair. Well, we all thank you. So the Big Door Prize coming out in October. You know, for a man who has so many voices, he truly has a unique take on everything. Was there a question you would have liked me to ask, Jim? If so, drop it in the comments. And I'm sure one of his many, many personalities will be sure to get back to you. As for me and my personality, find it on all of my socials. Now, next week is a very special episode for me because I'm talking to Danny Bowman, young entrepreneur, animation maven, and probably the most driven person I've ever met in my entire life. I have three strikes in me. It's not just the age, but also about being a female and being being a woman of color and also being autistic.